five years. That's amazing. Well, I tell you, relationships are important, and we need to know that when it comes to relationships, I believe that we have to ask ourselves a very important question. That is, how big is our heart? How big is our heart? Now, we're going to we're gonna sink into this a little bit. I'm going to unpack that thought for you, and hopefully by the time you get done today, uh, we can understand how big our heart is, and, and we'll understand what our heart is. Because that's really important. We need to know what our heart is. We need to know what is going to be our heart. And that's really important. Now, you may say, Pastor, your heart's that blood pumping thing inside your body. Yes, it is our heart. I get that. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about something that's totally different. All right? Now, look with me, if you would. In the book of First John, that's where we're going to launch out of today. First John and chapter three. So if you take your Bibles, turn there, or uh, or thumb over to that, uh, whether you have it electronically or whether you have uh, a written form or what. But if you would get there, First John and chapter three. Now, for those that don't have your Bible, we have uh, we have them here on the screen uh, for your convenience. So don't worry. But if you do have it, I would encourage you. Uh, to open it up and to follow along with us as we read. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 16, now I'm going to be reading quite a few verses today, so you want to just be ready. That's why I say go ahead and get your Bible out and follow along with me. By the way, I can tell you this. I have found, if I can have everybody's attention for just a moment, I have found if you have a hard time paying attention to church or you like drift off and all that kind of thing, a good way to stay connected is to pull out a piece of paper and take notes Write down key things that you hear. Write down things that will you can go back and look at later, verses you can write down. All right? I think it's really important that we do that. Now, I'm a visual kind of guy. When I was a kid, I used to sit and I'd draw pictures of the message. People say, you shouldn't be drawing in church. I probably have better notes than they did, to be honest with you, because uh, my pictures were pretty detailed. I am a picture guy. I like pictures. Matter of fact, I'm sure Robert saw that in my notes. I drew a picture here uh, as I as I developed my message and wrote out my notes. I drew pictures because when I visually see that picture, it brings it to life to me and helps give me some direction. So, look, however you take notes, I would encourage you to do that, all right? But hopefully your notes will be about the message and not to one another, okay? All right, now, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. Follow me if you would. It says, by this, we know love. I have to stop there for just a minute. If we're going to understand love, and we're talking about love, we're talking about relationships, if we're going to understand love, then we need to know what love is. And when the scripture says that this is love, I think we need to stop for a minute and listen to what it's about ready to tell us. Okay, so I'm just, I want to highlight that. I want you to stop and hear what the scripture is about ready to say to us. By this we know love, that he, God, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Now, understand this. We know that love is perceived, as the King James puts it, love is perceived by this, that God laid down his life for us and that we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. We ought to do that. Now, what does that mean exactly? I can just simply say this, that God loved us so much that he left heaven, he left all that he had to come and to walk on this earth, to to be connected with the infirmities and the problems and the trials and the hurts and the pains that you and I experience. I don't want you to miss that. And, And then he ultimately laid down his life for us. Now, he laid down his life in the sense that he walked away from his life as he knew it in heaven. Right? That's laying down your life. And then, and I think sometimes we get narrow-minded. We only think, well, laying down his life meant he laid down on the cross and they nailed him on the cross and he died on the cross. That's only part of the story. He laid down everything that was his conveniences, as we would call them. He left heaven, he left the glory of heaven 
to come and to live on this earth that sometimes we just get fed up with if you've lived here long enough. If you're young yet and you haven't experienced that, you will. Not to be a Debbie Downer, but you will. There will come times where this life is not going to be as, as pleasant and, and exciting to you as maybe it was when you were younger. God laid down his life by coming. He laid down his life. And then ultimately, he laid down his life on the cross for us. And the scripture says here that even so, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Again, we can also oftentimes interpret that to say that means we need to die for other people. Well, ultimately, there may be some of us who will put ourselves in arm's way and die on behalf of somebody else to protect them, to save them, or whatever that might be. But I believe there's something way more in depth than just that alone. That could be part of it, but not all of us are going to experience that kind of depth of love by laying down our life physically for someone else. But we can lay down our life just like Jesus did by leaving all the conveniences of what we know and by taking on pain and the hurt and the journey of other people to help them to experience what they're going through and sometimes uh, allowing ourselves to, to leave the conveniences as we know them. But it goes on to say in verse 17 but if anyone has the world's goods what, what, what is that talking about? Help me out. Speak back to me. We're going to have a little dialogue, okay? This can be monologue or dialogue. Today, we're going to have a little bit of dialogue, all right? I want to ask you, what are some of the world's goods that this could be talking about? Help me out here. Money, all right. What else? That's the first one. Generally, everybody kind of slaps on the top of the list, right? What else? What's that? Shelter, okay. What else? Food, all right. What else? Clothes, all right. What else? Whoa, I just heard about two or three real quick, but you got to be a little louder. You got to be a little more dominating over the ones that want to talk over you. Say it again. Chocolate. All right, yes. All right, what else? A band. All right, now here we go. All right. What else? All right. So we've gone from material things now, friendship, what else? Family, okay. What else? Okay, you cheated. <laughs> All right, no, I'm kidding. That's true. Time, right? Time's an earthly good, is it not? True? I mean, when we get to heaven, who needs time? Time don't exist. We're only limited by time here on earth. We know time because it's an earthly good. It's something that's our earthly good. Our finances, our friendships, our family, our possessions, our money, our time, our, our opportunities that we have, those are earthly goods, aren't they? Now I want us to think about this for a few moments. It goes on here in this passage to say, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Now hear me out for just a minute. Not all of us have money. All right, well, we all have money of some sort, but some have money. You know what I'm saying? Some have money. They're able to do pretty well whatever they want to do. There's others who don't have much money but they make ends meet and they do what needs to be done. There are some who have more earthly possessions than others. There are some who have bigger families than others. There's a lot of things that all of us have pieces and part of, but there's one thing that all of us have the same as far as earthly goods, and that's time. All of us have the same. There's no one person got more time than another person. We all have the same amount of time. So, because time is transcendent across all of us, I'm going to just kind of barrow in on that one thing, though don't minus out in your head. If you have possessions, 
We're talking about that as well. If you have family, we're talking about that as well. If you're talking about friendships, you have that as well. If you have bacon, we're talking about that as well, all right? Whatever it might be, we're talking about that too, but transcendent across all of us is our time. So we're going to use that as our reference point today, time. If you see someone who needs your time, and you turn around and walk away and don't give them your time, how can we say that the love of God abides in us when we don't give people of the possessions we have? It gets pretty real. See, because God, remember several, I guess it's been about a month or so ago, remember I said, there's, how do you spell love? How was it? T-I-M-E. God loves loved us so much that he took the time to come and spend with us on this earth and become like us. He gave us his time because we needed his time. And yet time seems to be the last thing in the world we are willing to to give away to other people because our life is so busy. We got so much going on and we got so many plans and we create so many schedules and all this kind of thing. And my friend, I want to tell you something. I believe that that is one of Satan's biggest ploys is to get us so busy that we don't have time. And time's what we have. But yet we want to substitute it with, well, I'll throw a little cash that way. Maybe that'll make them happy. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll give them a little bit of my possession. I'll let them borrow my car or whatever. And those are great things. Nothing wrong with that. If you have it, you ought to do it. But don't allow that to be a substitute for your time. And it goes on to say here in this passage, yet if we close our heart against them, how does God's love abide in him. Verse number 18 now says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Let's be careful not to sit back and go, Oh yeah, I love people. I love you. I really love you. Man, my heart just breaks for you. I love you so much. And you know, but you know, I hope things work out for you. I'll be in prayer for you. I don't have time to talk to you. Can't really help you. But you know what? I love you. Tell that to a kid, and they're going to laugh at you in their heart but as they cry. Because when kids are asked, what is the one thing that you want more than anything else in the world? Parents may say, oh, you know, they want this toy, or they want to be able to go to this amusement park, or they want that. But at the end of the day, you ask a kid what they want, and all they want is time for their parent. That's all they want. They truly want their time. And yet, that seems to be the thing that we hoard the most. We protect the most because it's precious to us. It's like the Lord of the Rings. It's our precious. And we want to hang on to it. We don't want to let it go. But it's the thing we got to let go of the most is our time. Now, let me say this morning, this message is a message that's not only geared to touch your heart and life, it's geared to touch mine too. And I want to tell you, no matter how hard that we may want to get that right, we're not always going to get that right. And I can tell you, I mean, for all of us, we're not going, I mean, we can say all the right things, but at the end of the day, that doesn't mean we're always going to end up doing the right things. We're going to get into that a little bit too. But it's a matter of where our heart's at. And it's a matter of not just letting it be words, but that we're truly endeavoring to work at that and to make a difference and to make the connections that we need to make. Verse number 19. By this we shall know that we are the, of the truth and reassure our heart before him. Do you know your heart has to be reassured of things? You know that? Okay. Have you ever, like, let's use the illustration. Have you ever seemed like you got things together with you and God? I mean, like, like this. I mean, things got tight 
you know what I'm saying? Like you got into the Word of God, like it became a passion of your heart to want to get in the Word of God every day and to pray, to watch things on TV you knew were honoring to God. If something came on you knew wasn't honoring to God, you were quick to change the channel or turn it off. And, and when uh, your family called, you really were concerned about their needs and you listen to them, or if a friend was hurting, you took time to get in your car and drive over and sit down with them and just and just be there for them, and you just, you felt like you had everything going right. Anybody ever been there before? All right, you need to get there then. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Have you ever been there before? Come on, wake up. Are we awake in the auditorium? Surely, more than that, has felt like you've had it together with God. I have my hand up. I have felt like I've been there. And then like two weeks into that, all of a sudden, one thing happens. Boom. And all of a sudden, it like erases everything that you've been doing. And you feel like a failure. Okay. How many of you have been there before? Okay. All right. Now we're getting a little more honest, right? Because at the end of the day, we can all find ourselves doing the right things, and, and man, things are just chugging along, seem like things are going so great, and then all of a sudden one thing can happen, and that one thing can cause us then for our heart to lose assurance. And then there can come a point where what do we say? We say, you know what, I, I just, I guess this isn't for me. I can't do this. You know, other people seem like they got it together, they got it happening, but I get it going, and about the time I think I get it right, all of a sudden, boom, I fall flat on my face. I can't do this. I felt that way many a times. I'm old enough to have felt that way many, many, many a times, and I have. And I want you to know today, you're not alone in that feeling. Because we can all feel that. So the scripture says our heart needs to be reassured. Why is it that our heart needs to be reassured? Let's go on and look at the verses. It goes on to say in verse number 20, for whenever our heart condemns us, oh, whoa, 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 back up, hold on a minute. If I'm a believer, how can my heart condemn me? Our heart can condemn us. I want you to understand that's why we have to reassure our heart because our heart is condemning. It condemns us. It says to us after two weeks of doing everything right, we do one thing wrong. Our heart says, see, you can't do it. You'll never be able to do it. No matter how hard you try, you're going to keep messing up. What's it matter? Why do you keep trying? That's your heart. Don't miss that. As long as your heart has the ability to speak to you, it will, and it does. And it says that you're condemned. And it says, for whenever our heart condemns us, <laughs> I love this, God is greater than our heart. All right, so I said this to a few different people this week. You may be in a room, you may not be in a room. I've said this to a few people this week. What's greater in your life? Is your problems greater than God? If so, you have a lot to worry about. But if your God is greater than your problems, you don't have anything to worry about. Because God is greater than our heart. God is greater than all things. And if God is greater, if God be for me, who can be against me? Because if God is so much greater than these peddly little things that may seem huge to us humanly compared to a great God or they're nothing and yet we worry about these little things because we allow our God to become smaller than our problems than our issues and therefore our heart condemns us and our heart will condemn God too how could God do this See how, how the heart works? The heart's powerful. The heart is an unruly evil. And all of us have to deal with it. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the heart is wicked and deceitful above all else. Who can know it? I want you to know the heart is not. A good, listen, 
the, the, the advice that we Americans have given to the world to follow your heart is the worst piece of advice I believe that America could ever come up with. Follow your heart. Really? I'm not going to follow something that's wicked and evil and deceitful. Why would we follow something that's, that's that way? So what is the heart? We have to make sure we define what the heart is. I want you to understand this. The heart is simply... The heart equals our feelings. And feelings come and go. Look, follow your heart just simply means follow what you feel you ought to do. Follow your feelings. Well, I don't know about you, but one day I can feel really good, and another day I can feel really bad. One day I can really like being around somebody, and another day I can just not want to be around them at all. Welcome to my feelings. Anybody else in here like that? not, you don't have a heart. Something wrong with you, because that's the heart. The heart is fickled and deceitful. It's wicked. It'll fool you. It'll condemn you. It's like, why in the world, the last thing in the world that we would ever try to do to ourselves is to condemn ourselves. Why would, we do, why would we do that? I mean, we are the only we we have. Why would we, we, we not want to do the right thing and encourage ourselves? Why would we want to condemn ourselves? Because that's your heart. It's a jerk. It's a moron. Our heart is a moron. And we can't listen to our heart because our heart will lead us down a trail that will be so discouraging and, and so hopeless. And yet, if we're not to follow our heart, then what are we supposed to do? Once again, I love that verse 20. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. You know what that means? He who is greater than our heart knows that you are going to condemn yourself. He knows that you're going to do right, do right, do right and fall flat on your face and you're going to feel like a loser. He knows that already and he's yet greater than that. Quit living in that. Quit allowing that to wag you around as though that's important. It's not important. God is greater. God is greater than all my sin. No matter what I do, there's, a, there's the, the songwriter that wrote, God is greater than all my sin. You know that song? Awesome. There's no sin that I com, could commit that God's not greater than that sin. So we go on to see here in verse number 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, We have confidence before God. Now, wait a minute. I, now, this is a head scratcher for a moment. Because the Bible says our heart does condemn us. But then in the next verse, it says if our heart does not condemn us. But it already said that our heart condemns us. So how could it not condemn us when it's condemning us? Good question, right? Let me give you the answer. You ready for this? Something can't condemn you if you can't if you don't listen to it. It can try to condemn me all day long, but if it, if I don't listen to it, I'm not condemned, right? Does that make sense? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? If I don't listen to it, I'm going to be all right. It's when I listen to it, it's when I yield to it, that's when I become condemned in my heart, in my spirit. And so the scripture is saying this, if that which tries to condemn me has no power of condemning, then what does it say there in verse number 20, 21? We have confidence before God. So I can come to the throne of grace. I can have a relationship with God that, that is a, a relationship with much confidence, not based on the fact that my heart's not trying to condemn me because it is always trying to condemn me but when I see that my God is greater than my circumstances and my problems and greater than my heart then I can know I don't have to live in condemn condemnation I can live in peace and joy and confidence that's in the Lord isn't that amazing I don't like finding myself in certain places of thought and frustration and irritation 
and isolation and all the other shunts. I don't like them. But I don't have to be found captive to those things. And that's what my heart wants to do to me. Because listen, when we feel condemned, we will run from God. Isn't that what Adam and Eve did in the garden? They took the fruit and then their heart condemned them and they ran from God and they hid from God. That's exactly what happens. Our heart is like that. When we listen to our feelings and our emotions, it will cause us to run from God. Hey, it's just like a little kid in a home. You know, you, when you were a little kid and you broke something and you knew you were going to get in trouble for what you just broke, so what do you do? You go run and hide, thinking that's going to fix everything, right? I remember when I set the house on fire when I was just a kid, first grade. I was always, I, my mind's always worked overtime. You know, I just like, why do we go outside to like to a barrel and light the fire? And why should I have to pack trash out there? I can just burn it right here. Simple solution. In a plastic trash can, and all of a sudden flames are rolling up the, the, the wall in the kitchen. And I'm thinking, oh no. And now I hear mom coming down the hallway. I hear the floor creak, and I thought, uh-oh. So I ran in, and I thought I was going to distract her, and she'd never know. And it would all burn out, and we'd be done. And so I said, Mom, I love you. And she bent down to hug me and saw smoke rolling out of the kitchen hallway. And she's like, whoosh, and she runs in the kitchen. And I thought, hey, the best thing I can do is go hide. You know, if I go hide, I'll never get in trouble. Doesn't work like that, does it? The best way to deal with our issues is to hit it head on. It's not to run from it. And when we're willing to run headlong to take care of our problem, when we've done wrong, when we shoulder up responsibility, and we, you know what that's called? Listen to me. You know what that's called? That's called repentance. When we repent of our sin, it's when we run to God and we say, God, I admit what I did was wrong. God, I want to make it right with you. And the scripture says, if we confess our sin, then he just might. If you're a lucky person, you've been living a really good life, he might forgive you of your sins. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that. He says, if we confess our sins, he is greater than your sins. And he'll forgive you of your sin. And he'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Because he's greater than your sin. He's greater than your problem. And when God's greater, then your problems aren't so great anymore. When God is greater, you don't have to let those things dictate where you go and what you do in your life. You just keep doing what you need to do. You just keep living like the way you're supposed to live it. And you just trust God. And you can live in the confidence of the Lord when your heart's not allowed to condemn you anymore. That doesn't mean you'll not have voices around you trying to condemn you. You just got to turn them off too. Shut them down. I don't have time for that. Life's too short. You don't allow that to take place. And it goes on to say here in uh, verse number 22, and whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. All right, now hear this out. If we don't allow our hearts to condemn us, we have confidence in the Lord. And when we have confidence in the Lord, then we keep his commandments and, and then uh, the things that we ask, we're able to see happen and keep it in context. What's it talking about? Is it talking about that... Uh, Jaguar you want or that uh, Rolls Royce that you want or that like 15,000 square foot home that you want. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the ability to do and to love and to care and to share your earthly goods with others. We ask God and he'll give us the ability to do it. Not to consume it on ourselves, but to share it, to give it, to provide it and to be used of him in a powerful way. Let's keep it in context. And it goes on here in this passage in verse 22. It says, and whatever we ask, we receive because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. What does it mean to keep his commandments and do what pleases him? All right, no need for me to try to explain that because next passage.
passage does. Look at verse 23. And this is his commandment. Aha! If we want to know what his commandment is, then we just need to read on. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to do what? And to love one another. Two things God calls for us to do. To believe in him, to love him, and to love others. That's what God calls us to do. What does it mean to love others? That means to give them your time. Give them of your earthly possessions. When they have a need, to meet their need. To provide for them what they have, what they have need of. And it goes on to say, verse number 24, Whoever keeps his commandments... Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Look, how how do I assure my heart that it's that it is in check with God? Because I one, don't let it condemn me. Two, I see God as being greater than my heart which tries to condemn me and then when I find that confidence that's in the Lord by not allowing my heart to condemn me then I'm going to live out his commandments and to live out his commandments is to love him because he's such a great God and to pour out onto others and keep his commandment and it's not just by words it's by deeds it's amazing see I think what happens is Satan tries to ball us up and tries to keep us thinking about nobody but ourselves, and, and so when we think about ourselves, well we start feeling good about the good things we do and then we get prideful and then we fall flat on our face because of our sin and then our heart condemns us that we ain't as good as we thought we were and so therefore all we're doing is in this vicious cycle of doing nothing but thinking about ourselves. and that's not even who we're supposed to be thinking about We're supposed to be thinking about God and how great he is and what he wants to do in and through us and let him do it. One more passage that we're going to go to this morning. Look with me, if you would, in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And uh, we're going to look here at Romans chapter 7 and verse 15 and following. But I want you to know this. Our heart equals our feelings, and feelings come and go. To follow your heart means to follow your feelings. I want you to know this. My warrant is in the word of God. And the word of God is what directs my steps. For it is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. It shows me the decisions I need to make with my life. And it doesn't matter how I feel about it. What matters is what does God say about it. That's how I have to live. And in that I find confidence, even when my heart tries to condemn me. So Romans chapter 7 and verse number 15 and following, it says, For I did not understand my own actions. Have you ever been there? <laughs> yeah, I'm with Paul right there. Don't always understand my actions. Why in the world did I do that again? Why do I keep letting myself get sucked right back into that again? For I do not understand my actions, he says, my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Have you ever known what you need to do and you just don't do it? And you turn around and end up doing the very thing you wished you, I mean, you never had intent of doing, but you, it ticked you off because you did actually the very thing you just despise. We can relate to Paul. I like Paul. Verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. Now, let me explain that because that sounds a little confusing. What that's saying is when I do what I shouldn't do, then I agree with the law because the law is good and so therefore it helps me to see the law is good and what I did was wrong and I agree with the law. In other words, in my mind, I agree with the law. That's what I should have done, but that's not what I did. That's what it's saying. And it goes on to say then, 
verse 17. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. In other words, he's separating his sin and himself. He's saying what I would do, that's those are the things I want to do. But yet the sin nature that lives in me seems to be dominating sometimes and causes me to do things that I don't even want to do. I know in my heart and mind what I want to do, but that's not what I always end up doing. Can you relate? Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. Do you realize that's the first key to not allowing your heart to condemn you is to realize there's nothing good that dwells in you. When you say, that's why I made the statement last week, one of the, I think one of the most damning statements that we can make about kids is, oh, they're really good down in their heart. They're really good. No, they're not. They're really evil down in their heart. And praise God that they can be good. Again, let's not get too pious because you were once a kid, all right? Evil is in the heart of a child. There's none good, the scripture says. No, not one. Now hear me out for a minute. If you go, yeah, I know the scripture says that, but all I can say is your butts are bigger than your God. Because when your God is bigger than your butts and everything else, there ain't nothing else that matters except for what God says. And if God says it, then that's the way it is. And God said, there's none good, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There is nothing within us. The scripture says right here that it is evil. There's evil down inside of us. And in verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. Praise God. The spirit of God that lives in me lives in my spirit, not in my flesh. I mean, it's kind of lodged inside here somewhere, but it's not about my flesh. It's about my spirit. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And some people say, oh, the devil made me do it. All right, shift the blame. It's what they did in the beginning of time, but take ownership. Don't shift the blame. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of the Lord and in my inner being, but I see in my members among another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members wretched man that I am Paul says who will deliver me from this body of death woe is me what am I going to do but he goes on to say and I love it I love it thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind but my flesh, I serve the law of sin. You see what he's saying? In my mind, I serve the law of God. I know what I want to do. I know what's right. And yet, it doesn't always seem that that's what I do. My flesh seems to lead me in a path that I don't want to go. And yet, I know that's the right thing. But I still seem to choose this at times. And I allow then, when I find myself in that place, for my heart to condemn me and causes me to push myself away from what's right and from him who's right. And the more that we allow our heart to condemn us, the further away from God we get. But the Bible says he that doesn't allow his heart to condemn him has confidence in God and knows there's forgiveness in God and can run to God who loves you and he puts his arms around you and he dusts you off and he says that's okay. Let's move on. Isn't it amazing that in a world that we live today, so often we'll judge other people and we'll look down on other people. And when somebody does wrong, we're quick to kick them while they're down. But how about if we just come alongside of them, we love them, we pick them up, we encourage them, and we give them our time, and we give them our concern, and we just try to love them closer to Jesus and help them to sense the love of God through us. I don't know about you there's hope in that there's power in that 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's through Him. Amen. We're going to read five more verses. We're going to be done with Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is, what's that next word? Therefore. What have I always told you about the word therefore? Always ask yourself the question, what? What's it there for? Why is there, therefore? Why? And I want you to understand, because what he is about to say is based of, off of what he just got done saying. In your mind, you want to do what's right. In your flesh, you end up doing the wrong thing. And therefore, based on that thought, let's listen to what the rest of the scripture says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous uh, requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their mind on the things of the spirit in other words don't allow your heart to condemn you by setting your eyes on the failure of your flesh but to have the Lord to set your mind and your heart on the things of the Lord and when your mind and heart are no longer when your heart is no longer able to condemn you you'll have a confidence in the Lord like one you've never had to keep on going despite who you are at times. That's why I'll often pray, God, thank you that you're willing to use me, not because of who I am, but despite who I am, you're willing to use me anyway. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm not going to let my heart condemn me when I've got such a great God. He's greater than all my sin. He's a God that's greater than your problems but he'll only be that great if you allow him to be that great in your life. He'll not force that on you. He relies on you to rely on him and to trust him with all your heart and to lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And he'll give you the confidence. He'll direct your path. He'll take care of it. Every hip bow, never eye close.